Do 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 Well, Sir Isaac Newton was wrong about a lot of things. But, uh, that's not to say his math was incorrect. I mean, even Newton, uh, Newtonian math was used for, uh, correct vector calculation for, like, uh, satellites to Mars and Jupiter. You can actually have correct math, and uh, Newton was a genius, but you can have completely incorrect explanations. Um, people love to use the word uh, um, polarity, and they love to use the word uh, vortex. And uh, when you ask them to actually define polarity and vortex, they certainly can't. But uh, everybody loves talking about the golden ratio, for example. But if you were to ask them, well, do you know what the actual golden ratio means? Well, sure, it's like the beauty of nature. It's a spiral. No, 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 that's a description of what you see that actually follows the golden ratio, but you can't actually get an explanation of anybody as to what the actual golden ratio is. And the golden ratio in simplex is 1 is to 5 is 5 is to 1, meaning an implication there by which and in which is that the principle and the phenomena are just extrapolations of themselves. It's literally the extrapolation of the attribute in manifestation. That sounds really complex, but it's actually extremely simple. I've explained that in a prior video, but getting back to a polarity and vortex. Actually, uh, Newton said that, uh, that things that are traveling in a straight line will continue to travel in a straight line, but there are no straight lines in Mother Nature. Well, we could draw a straight line on a piece of paper. All things in nature do not follow a straight line because everything is tied to either the plane of inertia or the point of inertia. When we actually talk about a plane of inertia, we would actually be talking about a mass, which would actually have a plane, just like a magnet. If this were a magnet, you know, the plane of inertia would be right here along the middle. And if I were to cut it a million different times, each different slice would have a north pole and a south pole. People say, well, does a magnet actually have poles? And well, sure it does. Like, no, it doesn't. You, well, yeah, I do. You can see it. There's the North Pole and there's the South Pole. Well, if they're located there, then they should be separable. And you actually have to explain incommensurability and point nonspecific. Okay? What actually defines a magnet is not part of the actual phenomena itself. There is no quantitative nature that actually defines a magnet. It is qualitative. Because before a magnet becomes a magnet, it is 100% quantitatively identical. When it becomes a magnet, it is qualitatively completely dissimilar. We actually have point source incommensurability. And I explain this in, to people in ways that their human, human brains can understand for you human beings. <laughs> and what's the distinction between a 5 watt laser and a 5 watt light bulb? Well, the distinction is what? They're both 5 watts. 5 watts in, 5 watts out. What's the distinction? 5 watt light bulb is really, really dim. It's pretty useless. A 5 watt laser, however, will burn the back of your retinas. It'll burn a hole in your skin. You know, it'll get the cops called on you if you, like, try to shine it down the street. I got a 5 watt laser. <laughs> They're really, really effing dangerous. So what's the distinction? It's obviously not... Uh, Quantitative, it's qualitative, but getting back to uh, the magnet, a magnet does not have poles. We actually have to define the terms uh, polarity, and then we actually have to then therefore conclude what's the denotation of the term vortex. There are no straight lines in Mother Nature. When Mother Nature draws a line, she's not like a human being that's like, well, we're going to start here, and I'm going to draw a line, and go from point A to point B. That is not a line of nature. Everything in the universe is either magnetism or dielectricity, and magnetism is the dielectric field. They're literally the yin and the yang of the entire universe. Uh, centrifugal divergence, i.e. force in motion, and centripetal convergence, which is the geometry of the hyperboloid. The geometry of magnetism is the torus. The geometry of dielectricity is the hyperboloid or the hourglass shape. And by the way, of course, logically so, following Occam's razor and pure simplicity of the most divine sort, they are the negative images of one another. The negative image of a hyperboloid is a torus. The negative image of a torus is a hyperboloid. They are literally the yin and the yang, the inseparable uh, binaries. And they're not binary, they're literally principle and attribute. When we talk about energy, when I say energy, people don't actually think of energy. 
When people think of energy, they think of an explosion or they think of like the lights being turned on. That's, it. that's the release of energy. That's not energy. Energy in its true sense, from denotation, is of course inertia, the original definition of inertia. When people think of energy, they might think of an atomic explosion. That's not energy, that's the impotency of energy. The true energy would be like that softball-sized lump of plutonium. You know, it's just silvery, it's sitting in your hand, and it's about the size of a softball. Wow. No one would think of that as energy. But that's the actual true definition of energy. And of course, this is where humanity always gets confused. They, they th see things upside down and backwards. Anyway, getting back to Mother Nature's line. Mother Nature's line is not from point A to point B. Mother Nature's line is from counter space to space, i.e. from inertia to the loss of inertia. The loss of inertia, however, is not two-dimensional. We actually have to extrapolate out the correct line of Mother Nature here in a second. It's not a straight line. Two-dimensionality does not give rise. A force vector, let me repeat this three times. I'm going to say it three times because it's so important. A force vector is three-dimensional. A force vector is three-dimensional. A force vector necessitatively must be three-dimensional. You can't have volume, i.e. mass and magnitude of the universe, by having force vectors that comprise, remember back in school or high school where they said, every atom is like 99.99999% empty space. It's kind of like a super gigantic uh, 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 inflatable ball the size of a, uh, of a skyscraper. And in the very center would be like two tiny BBs would be the nucleus. Well, this is accurate, but it's not empty. The actual volume or the air in the balloon of every atom measured in picometers, of course, is magnetodielectricity. It's because every atom is just nothing other than an atomic dynamo, right? But what gives rise to that volume? If every And this has been said also, and this is accurate. This is one time where science gets the... I don't have a sugar cube here, but I'm going to show it like a... You know, everybody knows the size of a sugar cube. They said if every human being on Earth, if all their atoms were shrunk down to just the nucleal... In other words, you know, the, the air and the balloon of all their atoms, that all of humanity would fit into the volume of the size of a sugar cube, and that is completely accurate. This means that basically all mass and magnitude is, it's not empty space, because space is not a thing. Space doesn't have properties. It is literally the balloon, because a toroid is pretty close to, you know, a donut, a torus, i.e. magnetism, i.e. the geometry of force and motion, i.e. the geometry of centrifugal divergence, yeah, that would be the air of the balloon. Yeah, right? Right? Yeah, that would mostly be defined volume. I mean, that is what the that so-called but incorrect empty space in every atom is. You cannot have a force vector that is two-dimensional. Mother Nature's line doesn't start from point A to point B. It goes from counter space, i.e. inertia, i.e. dielectricity, to space. But it's not this, it is this. It is a three-dimensional S-curve. Now, here's a two-dimensional S-curve. As you can see, it's flat. It's a piece of wire that's bent like an S. It's pretty close to an S. But how do you, actually, how do you define a three-dimensional S-curve? Well, you take either end of this wire bent like an S, and you'd bend them in... Well, actually, I'm bending it in... Yeah, I was bending it correctly. <laughs> Sometimes you look at something like this. I always bend them like this. If you bend them like this, you bend, bend each end in opposite direction. This, by the way, gives rise to phase shift. It gives rise to Lamore frequency, i.e. geomagnetic precession. It's also, too, why the Earth processes extremely slowly. Yeah, this is the phase of the mass actually turning and processing over an extremely long period of time. It's due to geomagnetic precession, Lamore frequency, the induced magnetic current, current of the toroidal sphere that the Earth actually sits enveloped in, which of course protects it from the solar winds. Anyway, this is a three-dimensional S-curve. This is actually kind of bent a little wrong, but you, know, you take an S and you uh, take uh, each end. I bend them this way, I bend one this way. And if you actually look at it down here, you kind of can't see it because it's a little crooked and it's hard to bend one perfectly. It actually forms a complete uh, circle on itself. It's a three-dimensional S-curve. And what this does, by the way, is it extrapolates out the interior geometry of the donut, i.e. the torus. Now this is bent a little wrong. You know, it would be more perfect if I did it like this and then bent this one like this to make it really kind of close to perfect. But a three-dimensional S-curve. You see it's still a little crooked. It's hard to bend it perfectly. A three-dimensional S-curve to bend is not all that easy. This also, too, defines a vortex. 
People say, what the hell is a vortex? I love talking about vortexes. Nature's vortex. See, do you know what the vortex is? No. <laughs> What's well, important to know what these things are, by definition, not by description. Man, look at that vortex. Look at the water going down the drain. That's nature's vortex. You know, look at that. And he's like, that is really cool. I love looking at vortexes as much as the, the next guy. But I'm more interested in the actual definition and the reasoning and logic and wisdom behind what a vortex is. As one with wisdom should want or be want to do. Yeah, of course that's the case. So, By the way, when we actually talk about a plane of inertia versus a point, a plane of inertia would be referenced to a mass where we'd actually have a plane relative to the mass, just like on a magnet. A point, of course, would be a single uh, force vector. And by the way, like I said, when you look at this end on, it forms a perfect circle. And by the way, this is the reason why magnetism follows the Poincaré disk model of projective geometry, which, by the way, supports 100% the holographic paradigm of the universe. Yeah. All mass and magnitude is completely illusory. It is due to the after effect of a divergent force vector. Let me repeat that. The after effect of a divergent force vector. Space is nothing. It, this what Nikola Tesla said, by the way. Space has no properties. It has attributes. Just like a shadow. A shadow is not a thing. A shadow doesn't act upon it. A shadow is an absence of light. A shadow is not a thing, even though it's a noun in the dictionary. A shadow is not a thing. Space is not a thing. It is the after effect of the absence of inertia. The nature of a force vector, which is three-dimensional, yes, leaves behind as its wake space. Space is the, uh, the false mirror of eternity. Let me repeat that again. It's very, very important. Space is the false mirror or the... Uh, the counterfeit or the faux mirror of eternity. True eternity would, of course, be inertia as unreleased of its energy. It is self-reflexive. Self-reflexive is yeah, a very important word also for metaphysics. This is the reason why I'm so interested and always have been in uh, true science, true field theory. It is because there is absolutely no effing distinction between field theory and metaphysics. This is like what a stupid person would say. If you like to, and I've heard this from PhD uh, physicists. Of, I'm a PhD of theoretical physics. It was physics is here. This is real science. This is metaphysics here. You know, this is like hokum and religious bullshit. No, 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 no. There's no distinction between physics and metaphysics. It's like talking about the head side of a coin versus the tail side of the coin. Well, the, the only real side is the head side. It's like, no, you can't have a head without having a tail. The ultimate reality, of course, is the silver of the coinage, right? This, you know, this guy can't be right. He's a PhD, a professor of theoretical physics. Not only can he, can he be right, he's an idiot. I've debated many of these people. I don't want to debate with you. I've got a PhD and you're just a peon. You're just a tattooed asshole on the internet. <laughs> oh, so that's how you get out of an intellectual debate on who's right and who's wrong. No, there's no distinction between physics and metaphysics. Anyway, getting back to the force vector. Mother Nature's line does not go from point A to point B. It goes from counter space to space, but it can't be two-dimensional, and the only force vector that is actual is a three-dimensional S-curve. Because a force vector, necessitatively so, must be a three-dimensional S-curve. Is the reason why every atom is 99.999% nothing. It's not nothing, it's magnetodielectricity because every atom is a dynamo. It is an atomic nuclear dynamo. It is literally churning up the ether. And by the way, that's a quote from uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz. He talked about the huge AC generators churning up the ether. That's the only thing an atom does. It churns up the ether and it creates its own volume measured in picometers. What do you think that 99.9999% nothing, and it's not nothing, is inside each and every atom. It's magnetodielectricity. It is literally the air of the balloon of the toroidal geometry of force and motion and centrifugal divergence, i.e. magnetism. The only reason anything in the entire universe has volume is due to one thing and one effing thing only, and that is, of course, magnetism. Why then, ask me again, why are you so interested in magnetism? It's like you devoted like several years of your life to understanding the nature of magnetism. It's like, that's the reason why? 
It's the fundamental foundation of everything that has mass and magnitude in the visible universe, and even the invisible universe to a great extent. It's due to magnetism and magnetism only. It's like, why ask that question? Just asking that question is itself ignorant, but it's okay. It's okay to be ignorant. I actually have absolutely no uh, problem with ignorance. It's okay to be ignorant, as long as you're asking questions and wanting to know. The people that I have problems with, and I want nothing to do with, and completely disassociate, I'm ignorant, I don't give a crap. You know, I don't mind being ignorant, don't pay the bills, and don't get me laid. I don't need to know that crap, because they don't put money in my bank. Those are the people <laughs> that I disassociate with. So I hope I explained to at least a superficial extent, and that's about as superficial as I could get on the subject of a three-dimensional force vector, i.e. magnetism. Yeah, I think I did a good job of explaining it in a very loose fashion such that anybody with a discriminating consciousness that's observing was like, yeah, I understand that. You know, I don't really get it totally, but I understand it. And that, of course, is the ultimate goal, three-dimensional S-curve, yeah. I hope you like these videos. If you do, you can always click the link below. You can tell me how much you hate me. Whatever makes you happy. Let's make a good head scratcher, you know, right here. You bend, you bend a wire into a three-dimensional S-curve. It's good for scratching the back of your head. That's right. I bet you can scratch other places with this, but I'm going to do that off camera. <laughs> right? Thank you so much. Peace out, Girl Scout. And as uh, fellow Illuminati say, Ruxi Veritas. That's Latin, by the way. Loxi veritas.